The International Monetary Fund has defended its calls for member countries to increase their contributions without changing their voting power. Speaking to DW's Marie Sina on the sidelines of the G20 Investment Summit here in Berlin, Kristalina Georgieva responded to criticism that countries like China are being asked to pay in more without getting more say. I'd like to start by talking about reforms. The executive body of the IMF recently passed a proposal to increase members' quota, so the money they pay into the fund, by 50%. At the same time, the voting power of countries will remain the same. So that means countries like China will continue to be underrepresented in terms of voting share. Do the United States and other IMF members really expect countries like China to pay in more while not getting more say? The decision to increase the quarters for the IMF uh, is driven by what is happening in the world around us. We have been hit by consecutive shocks, COVID, war, cost of living crisis, and that led to rapid increase in demand for IMF financing. Uh, we now have about 220 billion in financing to 96 countries. And that made the issue of the financial strength of the fund in a world of more frequent and dramatic shocks so very pressing that the membership has decided to take a two-step approach. Step one, make the fund financially strong. Step two, work on realignment of the shares of members, so countries that are underrepresented, China, but also others, I was just in Singapore, also underrepresented countries, that they can see the path towards realignment because we also need the fund to be legitimate. I want to stress that our members also took a very important step on representation by agreeing to add a third chair for Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. So the voice of Africa can resonate more strongly uh, in the decision making of the IMF. Right, but for now that there will continue to be a discrepancy between, for example, voting shares of China and the immense economic sway China holds around the world, doesn't that undermine the legitimacy of the IMF if it doesn't reflect the realities of today? This is why I stressed that the membership, including China, uh, have been clear that a step that is taken today is not the end of our process of strengthening the IMF. This is the step on financing because there is urgency for it. And it is complemented with a very clear agreement that by mid-2025, we will have aligned around the mechanism and a formula that allows realignment so countries that are underrepresented can take a step up. Uh, in other words, stay tuned, work continues. All right, what would you say to the critics who say China doesn't deserve more voting rights until it's not more cooperative when it comes to uh, debt relief, for example, around the world? It is important to also look into the dynamics of China's participation in debt relief efforts. China indeed has become a leading bilateral creditor over the last years, especially in Africa. That has happened with many Chinese institutions taking part and without initially coordination within China on what is the stock of debt, uh, which led to some unease in how China initially participated in debt restructuring. We have seen over the last year in particular, China taking more responsibility and acting more constructively in debt negotiations. And I welcome it and I very much encourage China to continue in that uh, uh, direction. We have created a new forum, Global Sovereign Debt Roundtable, that brings for the first time all creditors, traditional creditors, Paris Club, new creditors, China, Saudi Arabia, India, Brazil, 
the private sector creditors, and they are numerous uh, with significant contribution, and the debtor countries themselves. So we can have an inclusive forum, and that has helped tremendously. What has happened is a gradual reduction of time needed to reach a conclusion. And I'll, let me give you the numbers. Chad, 11 months. Zambia, nine months. Sri Lanka, six months. Ghana, five months. So we see a gradual improvement, and of course we have to do much more. I was gonna ask you about that improving timeline. Um, that's true, the time has decreased, but before the pandemic, the timelines for financial yeah. assistance from the IMF on average were much shorter even than this five Two months. to three months, yes. Exactly. Yeah. What's one thing, in your opinion, that needs to change within the IMF to make it more nimble? Uh, for us, we have done uh, quite a lot in modernizing our policies and their implementation, especially when we were hit by COVID and speed became virtually a factor between life and death. Uh, and I am proud to say that uh, the IMF is acting with a sense of urgency. Our first disbursement when COVID hit was just one week after WHO announced a pandemic. So we have moved quite uh, decisively and we are also looking into what more we can do uh, especially when it comes down to debt resolution. And something that was asked from us and we responded was give the creditors early picture of what may be expected from them. In other words, share our analysis early. Uh, this we do and we also look into how more we can engage the creditors and debtors on the basis of our objective analysis. But keep in mind, we are not a party of negotiations. It is between the creditors and the debtors. Keeping the focus though on what the IMF can do, mm -hmm. there's strong criticism about the IMF being too insistent on criteria while countries are defaulting on their debt, unable to pay healthcare, pay schools, for example. Would there be a possibility of injecting funds right away into those countries? Uh, well, we do have an instrument called emergency financing, and it is exactly for injecting financing with speed. We have used it very actively, but let me stress, our biggest contribution to countries rarely is money. Our biggest contribution is on the policy and institutional front. Help countries to help themselves. And something that is not very well known uh, thanks to my predecessor, Christine Lagarde, already in 2018, the IMF adopted a policy that I'm determined to implement with all the uh, prudency we can offer on public spending in the social arena by putting a floor in our programs. So education, healthcare, social protection, that they are served within the envelope uh, with uh, priority. I'd like to uh, touch on a different topic, which is central bank digital currencies, or CBDC, which sounds a little bit like a rock band, but <laughs> the IMF is currently working on a CBDC platform, but the funds uh, push for CBDCs comes at a time when the adoption of other cryptocurrencies has failed, for example, also um, the, the Cryptocurrency Libra was, was slashed, scrapped. Um, what can CBDCs offer? What problems can they solve that these other cryptocurrencies and other digital currencies couldn't? Well, the uh, number one advantage of uh, CBDCs is that they are backed by the state, by the public institutions, by the central banks of countries. And uh, what they bring is this finality of settlement that uh, the central banks in the world offer today. What is the advantage of CBDCs? Two, one, cut costs by making it so that the uh, use of 
money printed uh, becomes uh, obsolete. For an economy like the Bahamas, the first country to introduce CBDCs, where you need to carry cash at high expense to different parts in different islands, uh, this is a big advantage. And second, accelerate financial inclusion uh, by making it so that there is a push for digitalization and then digitalization steps into the world of money. There are today other private sector issued, um, let's call them stable coins because this is the universe uh, that is better protected, that are backed by assets. When they're backed by assets, they're private digital money that can succeed in serving the uh, uh, transactions uh, in the world. We are not against those. If these currencies are regulated, then they can play a role in the economic uh, system. Uh, when it comes down to CBDCs, where are we today? Well, at least 60% of the central banks of the world are moving in the world of digital money. There are already 11 countries with CBDCs, 19 quite advanced to move in that direction, 64 that are either piloting or researching deeply CBDCs. Are we at the end of this uh, trip? No, by a long mile. But should we be looking into CBDCs uh, seriously, the answer is yes. The beginning of a long road ahead. We're in Berlin right now, so of course I'd like to ask you some questions on the German economy, because the German economy is sticking out in the global picture right now because Germany is the worst performing leading economy at the moment. Of course, that's partially due to short-term shocks like energy prices, but which long-term structural issues do you think the German economy is facing right now? Well, let, let's start uh, from the uh, positive. Germany uh, did a remarkable job in dealing with the shock from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And the German people, the whole society, stepped up. Uh, energy efficiency improved dramatically. Where Germany is more vulnerable is being an export-oriented economy in a world of slow growth and slow Growth means less demand for German uh, products. Uh, it is more affected than other economies. What should Germany do? Well, continue digitalization, shift to the green economy, and uh, increase in productivity, meaning a lot of attention to the, to the labor force. And on top of these existing problems, uh, the German government is now struggling with a 60 billion euro hole in its budget because last week a German court decided uh, that the use of climate funds is unconstitutional. So that's a big hole. How do you think that will affect the German economy going forward? Well, it is a tough task uh, for the um, uh, Minister of Finance here in Germany uh, to figure out how to sustain investments uh, in digital and green that are critical for the future of growth. Uh, and I, I can tell you, it, he is not alone uh, struggling. All finance ministers today face this squeeze that comes from they had to spend a lot after COVID, and now they need to rebuild buffers and deal with prioritization of spending. Uh, looking long term, the best way to deal with a problem of this nature is grow faster. Or then taxing. You have, then you have more, or, or taxing. By the way, when we look at, at um, uh, one area of taxation that we at the IMF are very favorable for, uh, which is carbon pricing, uh, this is an area where the world has to take a deep breath, be brave, and actually do it. Because unless we price carbon to create an incentive for decarbonization, it will not happen fast enough. So perhaps this is, this is an area also for Germany to look into. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. Thank you.